Welcome to the classroom. In case you didn't know, this is Chris Dunaway with the LSU Ag Center. I'm the horticulture agent for St. Charles Parish. And today we're going to be talking about lawn care. We get a lot of people wanting to know the secret to a perfect lawn with zero inputs and zero effort. Well, the good news is I know exactly what to do to have that taken care of. And there you go. All you have to do is wave your magic wand and you can have a weed-free lawn with no pests and no problems. But in reality, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of work. It needs regular attention. It needs numerous inputs, including fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, water, and then it, um, additives to adjust the pH. Plus, don't forget tools, equipment, gasoline, and of course, labor. <laughs> lots and lots of labor to apply and use all these tools and everything like that. Labor is going to be one of your key things to having a really super healthy lawn. Um, one of the things that we like to say around here is if it's green, mow it. And um, Dr. Jeff Beasley, with the, uh, he's the turf specialist at LSU, he actually used this term the other day, I thought it was pretty funny, polyculture, to describe basically a lawn full of weeds, but it looks okay because you mow it and keep it all nice and neat. Now, these two pictures that you're seeing here um, are not the same house. These are actually neighbors. And in fact, the, um, in the pictures closest to me, you can see the other lawn kind of in the background. But here on the right-hand side is a nicely mowed, even edged, pretty-looking lawn, whereas the other one, because it's not uh, taken care of, it just looked unkempt. Um, pretty much anywhere you go around here that's park-like setting or something like that, it's not really any what we call turf grass. It's just what we, uh, this polyculture, this collection of other plants. Now, this is a really neat uh, place that I ran across. Kraus, here's a, uh, some alternatives to lawn. Basically, anywhere that they had trees, they had these large gardens with these native plants and shade-loving plants and things that were perennials that did not need a lot of care. And just a little bit of lawn space here and there where they got plenty of light and things that need to uh, have a healthy lawn. A couple of more examples. Here's some uh, nice uh, planting of ferns here. Now, this beautiful mansion with the, uh, all of that, that leery up here in the front. Just a nice, tall, shade-loving plant. So this kind of situation like this, not only is it very attractive, but it requires very little input, which is really going to be great for the future. So where does a good lawn start? Well, just like a lot of things, it starts with the foundation. I mean, just like a building or uh, if you're gonna grow a vegetable garden or something like that, you really have to start with a good foundation to get it going and the soil, in a case of a garden or a lawn, is the foundation for what we're dealing. So bed preparation is really important. Now we get calls all the time about people wanting to know how to fix their lawn. They usually send us pictures of, let's face it, a giant weedy mess, and they want us to know what happened and how to fix it. Well, the first thing we're gonna know is, how did you prepare the soil? I mean, if you just come in and throw sod on top of the native soil without doing any amendments or any kind of uh, cultivation, it's not gonna work very well. So you have to pay careful attention to the bed preparation. You want to, um, you want to make sure the grading is correct. You want to make sure the drainage proper. You want to check the soil pH if it's acidic or basic. And then you want to see how many nutrients are there. And there's many more things you want to do. You just want to make sure that this is done well. It does start with a clean canvas. So you have to remove all the plant material, lay down dark plastic, or use a non-selective herbicide to do so. Uh, you can either yeah, shade it out or use poison. That works best. That way it not only uh, kills just what's on the surface, but it kills any below uh, ground ports and por portions of the plant that might come back later. Then, like I said, you want to cultivate to a de depth of about six inches uh, to make sure that it's nice and loose. Be careful when you're dealing with adding soil over native soil, because what you can have happen is this layering effect where, say if you have heavy clay down below and you put some sand on top, or even vice versa, it's really weird uh, really strange the way water works. So if you look at this picture, you'll see that the, the very dark portion is the moisture spreading through that lighter colored soil on top. Almost to the bottom of the picture, you can see there's a darker band. 
So what's happened is that soil has penetrated down, hit that band of dissimilar soil, and now is going laterally. And it has to completely fill up all of this layer laterally before it will ever penetrate downward. So that's something you really have to watch out for. Uh, and that's why you want to till the soil. If you're going to be adding, you want to break up that native soil and get, get it kind of worked in there a little bit. The pH is very important. Um, this graphic shows you what's happening at various pHs. And you'll see that the, the different colored bands are the nutrients that the plants need. And at the different pH levels, the nutrient is either more or less available just to deal with chemistry. So it's either bound into a particle or something like that, so it's inaccessible to the plant or something. But this is why we have to watch our pH. A lot of the pH we see around here is very high, um, about eight or so, and across the lake you might see, say, something like a, a four even, so very acidic over there. So you want to take a soil test to get the pH. You want to, before planting, this is actually important with any vegetable garden or, or, or with grass, you really want to apply the lime or sulfur before you cultivate the soil because it is important to have really good contact between the soil and those amendments to get it to work and, and to change the pH more quickly. If you just come along and put, say, sulfur tablets on top of the soil and don't incorporate them in, it's going to take much longer to change the pH than if you get it incorporated. So try to put it on there beforehand and mix it in. And if you're starting a lawn, right before planting, you want to add a starter fertilizer. Now grass only really needs nitrogen. So here, in this case, we're going to put about a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet just prior to planting. We don't want to put it down there weeks in advance. Whereas, on the other hand, it is better if we could have put that sulfur or lime in there sooner um, because it takes a long time to change the pH anyway. So the sooner you add it, the better off you're going to be in getting that change to happen. But the fertilizer, wait until right before planting. So here on this chart are some of the maintenance recommendations for the different types of grasses that we grow. We don't grow very much common Bermuda on purpose, so let's just stick with the hybrid Bermuda, Zoysia, St. Augustine, and Centipede. Again, the carpet, we don't see very much carpet uh, grass in lawns. But the soil acidity, you see it's listed right here. So the hybrid Bermuda likes between 5.8 and 7.2, and down the line, 5.7, 7.2, up to 7.5 in St. Augustine, and between 5 and 6 for centipede. So it's a pretty good range there, but it's really good, especially the centipede, it likes a little more acidic, so that's, that's one that we really want to make sure that we got that pH right on, if we, since we know we're so basic or alkaline anyway. And this is important, this nitrogen requirement. The hybrid Bermuda requires a lot more nitrogen per year than the Zoysia, St. Augustine, or centipede grass. So you can see that it's between four and six pounds of fertilizer per year, whereas centipede only takes between one and two pounds of fertilizer. And this thing, next thing is the mowing height. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But so let's say we get these photos in, and it's a weedy mess. Well, not all hope is lost. I mean, it's, if there's a little bit of grass left in there, you can still uh, cultivate it and work with it and try to get it to uh, come back. You don't necessarily need to uh, start over from scratch. But treat, you can treat it like a mini establishment. So first of all, you want to control weeds. Now, a lot of us find that when we go out and put out a weed killer, uh, we're surprised to find that most of the lawn dies. Well, that means that most of your lawn was weeds. So once you kill off all those areas, you have to determine if there's enough grass in the area that will fill in or if you're going to need to uh, add some seed, sod, or plugs. So if there's still a little bit of grass left, um, there might not be much cultivation you can do, but if it's a complete bare spot, might as well go ahead and, and till it and do all those things that we could do since it's bare uh, before we put down any grass. Then you want to go ahead and address any drainage or, or um, grade issues. I mean, it, it, it could be that the poor drainage and things like that were what caused the lawn to have a problem in the first place. So you want to make sure you have all that taken care of. Once you get it back to where you want it to, 
you can then add the plants. Um, sod, of course, is, is big, large pieces. It's, it's much faster. Plugs is essentially you take the sod and you break it up and you spread them out and let it grow toward each other and seed. If it can be seeded, you can use seeds sometimes. And then, of course, from here on, either establishing a new lawn or trying to reclaim this, you want to start implementing the common cultural practices required for lawn care. And I know you're going to ask, what are those common cultural practices? Well, here they are. First, you have mowing. Yes, mowing is an essential part of grass maintenance, right? Of course it is. Fertilization, irrigation, airification. Some of us have never even heard of that. Thatch management, disease control, pest control, and weed control. All of these things are integral parts. They are as necessary to each other as... Uh, oxygen and water to us. So if you leave out just any one of these steps, you really can just be leading yourself on a downward hill. These are what you need to do to have a nice, healthy lawn. So this chart is in the Louisiana Lawns Best Management Practices Guide. And you can see that it's got the calendar across the top and the chores along the margin here. And it, you just follow along and look at whatever month you're interested in, and it will tell you if you should be doing this activity at this time or not. A lot of this has to do with whether or not the grass is dormant or if it's actively growing. For instance, fertilization. You only add fertilizer when the grass is actively growing and not too close to the winter. So we can see that starting here in March, we can start fertilizing the lawn, but then we're going to stop fertilizing in September. We can adjust the pH now. We're going to start mowing as the grass starts growing. Um, we may need to water it. It's not quite yet uh, time. It's not really hot enough and the, not really growing it enough to need a lot of water. Um, you shouldn't aer um, aerate or dethatch the lawn right now. That's really important to have it actively growing. But weed control is pretty much a year-long activity. It says that we have a break there between January and February, but that, that's not true anymore. Uh, we had tons of weeds in January and February, so that, that bar is solid in my consideration. And then, of course, uh, insect control, we do get a little bit of break for, from those main pests that we deal with, our warm season uh, insects, so over the winter they're sleeping just like the grass is. And disease control, that's kind of a year-round thing also. So. Let's just go through them right now. Mowing. Mowing is one of the most important things that you can do to have a healthy lawn. That is the one thing that you control that you have a huge effect on whether or not uh, the grass is going to be healthy or not. Mowing height is the most critical. I mean, so many times we see people setting the lawnmower either too, way too low because they don't want to mow it very often. And what you're doing is you're cutting into the crown in that case. You're, you're cutting into the growing part of the plant. You're really damaging it. Or they um, cut it too high. And then that grass itself, you know, think about grass, not as this pretty stuff that you're, you have on the ground, but think of it as little solar-powered factories. Every one of these things has a blade that sticks up to catch that energy to make all the other processes work. So it has to have the right amount of sunlight. But a very tall grass can shade out the grass behind it, so it's not as efficient as you think. You want to make sure you have a good, sharp mower blade. Um, when you cut this grass, you want to have it nice and, and smooth, even cut, uh, with no tearing and ripping. That, uh, that's going to reduce the amount of disease uh, that gets into the plant and the amount of water loss through that wound. You do want to maintain a proper mowing frequency. And there, here's another big problem, is people want to mow, especially too far apart uh, intervals. And so what happens is, again, let's look at that blade of grass. It will grow up and have this large blade up here, but then it'll have, a, have the shaft below it. And if you let it get really tall, and then you go and you, you cut it off, this is where this one-third rule, adhere to the one-third rule, comes in is you never want to remove more than one-third of the total grass height at a time. So if you do come across the field and, and you need to mow it, and it's been a while, you'll need to do it in a couple of different times. 
uh, and wait a day between them. So, you know, mow a third, then come back and mow another third and, until you get it down to the level you want, and then keep it up from there. And then also mow when the grass is dry. Uh, mowing it when it's wet, here again, it's, it's these re relationships. Mowing it when it's wet um, causes more disease problems. And if you can, leave the clippings. Why not leave the clippings on the ground, and then you might not have to fertilize as much, right? Now this is the mowing height uh, chart for the different grass types. You can see centipede has about one to one and a half to two inch range. That's what you want to set that mower out. You know, park your mower, mower on a flat surface, adjust the wheels until you have the tape measure is between one and a half to two and a half inches to the, the bottom of the deck. And do make sure that all the wheels are set to the same level and not can't, uh, cockeyed some which way. St. Augustine has the largest um, height that it likes to have between two and a half to three and a half inches of, of growth. That's when you see a really good, healthy St. Augustine lawn. It's, it's got that very coarse texture, but really nice, tall, green grass. That, um, that's why it, it likes that very, very, this, the, there's fewer blades per inch, so the grass can be a little taller, so it's not shading out its neighbor. Zoysia. It's the opposite of that. It, like, it has very fine, very fine little, little blades, and they, they're very tightly and close together. So you only want to measure, mow that between one to two inches. So that's very low. You know, you, you're just um, nice, nice mat there, and that's way it, so it's not shading out its neighbor. And Bermuda between three quarters to one and a half inches. That's that's the lowest and the tightest grain. So that's definitely. Um, which you're gonna have a nice fairway or something like that on the golf course. Now, fertilization. There's a whole lot of debate about fertilizing uh, things because uh, you know fertilizing is a, is a huge uh, input. It takes a lot of uh, resources to make fertilizer and things like that. Uh, one thing about grass, though, it really only needs nitrogen fertilizer. So you don't need to be adding a complete fertilizer. You don't add 13, 13, 13. You really just want to go to the feed store and get nitrogen, uh, whatever form they have. But you, you want to, don't always necessarily need to fertilize everything. You know, the, the need for fertilizer depends on the growth rate, the density of the grass, the color to some extent, how well the roots are growing, and, and also disease susceptibility. You know, if it's, um, <clears throat> if the grass is already weak, it's not going to need fertilizer, and too much fertilizer can actually uh, cause it to have the opposite effect and make it go down. So when do I apply and how much do I apply and what type do I apply are all these questions that, that we get. Well, this chart here, also in the Louisiana Lawns Best Management Practices Guide, shows you the different types of grass and when you should be fertilizing it and how much. Now, if we go to, you know, I, I kind of like St. Augustine grass, so let's just go across there. So we see that if we have, and by the way, this, this on the side, the fast and slow refers to the, the fertilizer, if it's a quick release fertilizer or a slow release fertilizer. So if we're going to be doing St. Augustine and we're just using a straight uh, quick release fertilizer going across, we don't uh, fertilize in January, we don't fertilize in February, <clears throat> we don't fertilize yet in March, we fertilize for the first time in April with one pound per thousand square feet of nitrogen. Then we go ahead and skip, and we come back in, in June, and we may need a an, an third application in August, depending on how it is, but probably not, really. If it's healthy, you probably won't need that. Now, one thing that's important to note, is, and I stressed this earlier, is that it says one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, and that's actual nitrogen. If you look on the bag of fertilizer, it has a ratio, and say like a typical lawn fertilizer has got 29% of nitrogen in it. So it takes just over three pounds of that fertilizer to get one pound of actual nitrogen. So remember that when you're doing, uh, doing your purchases. Now, <laughs> Dr. Beasley was saying in his, uh, he actually has been suggesting instead of the pound maximum per thousand square feet, he's actually saying, only use half a pound 
of nitrogen per thousand square feet. And then increase the number of fertilizations uh, depending on how well it's doing. So you may find that you need less fertilizer, but by putting less fertilizer out more frequently, you're actually, it's gonna be actually more available for it over a steadier uh, range of time. So you're gonna get smaller fluctuations instead of these large um, inputs of the, of the fertilizer. <laughs> Irrigation. Irrigation is an extremely important practice that provides supplemental water between rainfall events. So grass needs water, plants need water. If it's not coming uh, from the sky, it needs to be coming from the hose or from the sprinkler system. So you need to add water pretty continuously, but you'd rather, it's better to water deeply. You wanna let that water go down, soak in to about six inches and then let it dry out a little bit before watering it very deeply again. By watering deeply, you encourage those roots to go all the way down as deeply as that water does. If you only water deep enough to reach two inches down into the soil, you're only ever gonna have two inch deep roots. So deep watering encourages deep roots. You want to do it every three days, three or four days, depending on the weather and the soil type. So I'll talk about that in a moment. You want to scout the field. Scouting is important. That's one of those um, things you do in between all the other jobs is you want to walk around and look and make sure, see how the grass is doing. Uh, you want to look for wilting plants, uh, dry soil conditions. One of the uh, tells when grass is very dehydrated is that when you step on it, you can, it will re uh, retain the footprint in the grass instead of springing back. So if you start seeing the footprints, you know it's time to water. Now, it is best to water in the morning. If you, can, if you can manage to do it between 5 and 8 a.m. in the morning, that's really uh, the best time. It uh, reduces the amount of disease that you're going to have. It's going to reduce the amount of, of transpiration, of, of water just going into the environment. So the, by giving the, chance, the, the plant a chance to really dry out before the nighttime comes, uh, you're going to prevent a lot of diseases. The, the amount of water is also going to depend on the soil texture. If you have a very, uh, this uh, graphic shows the soil uh, texture triangle, and there are basically three particles. There's sand, silt, and clay. And each one of these is uh, a different size range with, of course, the, the sand particles being the largest and the clay particles being the smallest. Well, you know, if you go to a sandy beach, the wave rushes up, it's completely wet, and as soon as the wave goes away very quickly, the water soaks down into that soil and disappears. So you, it has a very high degree of, of drainage, and you can take in about two inches of water per hour. Whereas clay, on the other hand, I mean, let's face it, you can make cups and pots and bowls out of clay, so it, it obviously holds water. So if you have a very heavy clay soil, it only permeates about 0.2 inches of water. So this is gonna mean that you're gonna have to put on that sprinkler for either much, a much lower setting, or you're gonna have to do much more uh, small waterings. So you have to water it until you get to the point of runoff, let it soak in, water it to the point of runoff, let it soak in until you finally get to that depth. And once you get that, um, once you know how to do it, how to get it in there and what it takes, you can give you, get yourself a little system or maybe program your sprinkler system to do that. But it, it all depends on this. And also it depends on the amount of compaction and the presence of organic material. Organic material is kind of like uh, the umpire between the soil particles. It gets in there and it keeps them apart. Uh, so if you have a good uh, organic soil, it's going to drain better. Whereas if all that uh, organic material is left and you have a very heavy soil, then it's more likely to hold water. And then compaction is important. And compaction will comp just, as you press those soil particles together, um, uh, much less, there's much less pore space, there's no place for the water to go, so that inhibits drainage. Now, 
So compaction does it leads to low lower oxygen levels in the soil. It leads to poor drainage. It can physically impede the root from penetrating the soil. And with increased water holding, it can uh, promote some advantageous plants that like that uh, those poor growth conditions, things like algae and weeds. Um, in fact, some of the indicator weeds that show that you may have a soil drainage problem are annual bluegrass, goosegrass, knotweed, spurge, pathrush, and of course the algae is, uh, that green growing on the surface is, is definitely an indication of poor drainage. Now this is an interesting little photo. This is a, a, an experiment they did in a laboratory where they grew these, I guess, the, I think that's a corn plant, but they grew them in these little test tubes with various, various degrees of soil compaction. And you can see that the one that has the very low compaction has a very healthy, visible root system and good growth above. And each degree of increased compaction you get down, you have uh, stunted growth with uh, fewer roots visible. So we definitely have to fight soil compaction. There are ways to combat compaction. First of all, you can use alternative plants that have more aggressive roots that will penetrate deeper into that soil, basically injecting organic material down into the soil profile, breaking up and dividing up those mineral components. You can also increase the soil organic matter through um, adding it on the top and tilling it in or using core aeration. You can reduce the traffic over the surface of the area that will uh, help reduce compaction and leave the leaves. If you're dealing with an area under trees, then leave the tree leaves on the, then leave the leaves that fell off the tree on the ground. Go ahead and grind them up with a mower or anything. But as they build up, they will produce a nice cushiony um, mass under the tree that will, uh, it's good for the soil and it will reduce that compaction. So this is an interesting graphic and this is what I'm talking about with alternative plants. Um, going across the, the, the graphic here, you can see different kinds of plants. And above the center line is how tall they grow, and below it is how far their roots go down into the ground. So we can see that grass has a very short top, but very, very low growing roots. They do not penetrate. Uh, healthy grass maybe penetrates to six inches, but more likely uh, less than four inches. Whereas all these other plants, uh, make very massive, uh, complex root systems that go very deeply down into the soil. And as these plants live and die, that organic material will stay behind and help build a better soil profile. So anything we do to encourage alternative plants is going to help uh, deal with all that compaction and some of these drainage issues we have. Core aeration is a really uh, neat process. It uses this machine to go in and physically pull these little plugs out that you can see, and leaving that open hole. Now, what I would recommend is going over this now with a combination of fine compost and sand and getting it down in those holes. Now, if you are gonna put that uh, fill on here and you're gonna do this aeration, go ahead and add your amendments to lower or raise the pH and also your fertilizer before you do this because anything that goes in those holes is gonna do better uh, and it's gonna be covered up by that fill so it'll have better contact with the soil and also less likely to move away from the site. How frequently should you aerate depends on the, the type of soil you have, the traffic in the area, all these things. You just need to go out and uh, monitor it and see how that's doing. Thatch is a huge issue around here. Thatch, I see thatch all the time. We get, when I get these calls, I go out and thatch. You can see this cross section. Uh, between the soil and the actual grass is this thick layer of all these things. It's like if maybe you didn't wash your hair for a long time and there was all the dead hair and dead skin in there right up close to your scalp. You understand you might have um, some scalp problems. Well, the same thing going on here. In this zone, it stays wet and the disease can flourish. The, the bugs get down in there and they, 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 they thrive and flourish. And then if you try to use an insecticide, it's all gonna get blocked by this thatching material. So you, you really need to take care of it. It also 
is hydrophobic, so it prevents sometimes water from going in. <clears throat> and it can alter the temperature tolerance. By having a, a whole lot of thatch, the grass is no longer growing in the soil, it's growing in the thatch, so it's really uh, vulnerable to cold damage. One way to control thatch is by using a, a vertical mower. These machines will go through there and they have blades that cut through the grass like this rather than horizontally that, like we're used to. It, will, it goes in there and basically rips all that dead, dead, dead and built up material up and out and brings it to the surface where you can then rake it and pull it away. Another way to control thatch is through top dressing. But what is top dressing? It's simply a uniform application of soil and or organic material spread over the entire surface. Uh, you would use it to either control thatch, you could use it to help smooth the surface of minor imperfections, you can promote recovery from injury and disease, it can an enhance an installation by um, spreading it over a sod or plugs to, to um, level the ground and to have better contact with the soil. And you can use it to modify existing soil, but it will be a slow process if all you're doing is putting something on the surface. Now, it, what it will not do is important also, is it's not gonna fix drainage, it won't fix grading, and it won't fill holes. Anything like that, uh, you're gonna have to remove any grass that's there and basically start with a mini restoration uh, with, before any of these big changes are gonna be possible. Now, you might ask yourself, what should you use? Well, if you're not going to be doing any kind of incorporating or anything like that, or, or core aerating, it's, pretty, it's a good idea to use a soil very similar to what's already there. Like I showed you this graphic earlier, if we have this layering effect, if we put soil that is too dissimilar from, what's, uh, from the native soil below it, we'll have the layering effect, which will cause these weird drainage issues. Now, if I was going to uh, core aerate it or uh, do some tilling or something like that, I really like a, a finely screened compost, 50-50 um, mixed with uh, coarse sand. That gives you that good organic material as, as well as those large uh, sand particles to help improve the drainage. But when you're modifying the soil, it's really a good idea, like I said, to go ahead and core aerate, to, to, to open it up so that you can have that exchange. You're gonna remove the plugs and then spread up to two inches of soil over that area. Um, that's up to two inches. What's important to know is you don't ever want to bury the grass. You, you know, it's like I said, it's a, it's this um, solar-powered machine. So if you if you cut off the solar panels, the quick the grass quickly starts to die. So don't uh, ever put more than that would actually cover the grass. You want to see the little blades poking through. But you can do this um, twice, maybe three times a year if you do it soon enough to uh, help bring that level up. But be careful if you're working over trees, you don't want to add too much soil over the roots of trees at any one time either. Now, if I was doing it for thatch management, I would add less, but again, with that um, compost and sand, I would apply, uh, do about half an inch of soil, but I would repeat this every two to three weeks. Let that stuff uh, acclimate, get growing in the new soil, and then go from there. <laughs> Pest control is a big issue, but luckily there's only five pests that are a big problem, but you do have to pay attention and be ready for them when you do see them, because some of these guys can do quite a bit of damage very quickly. Uh, chinch bugs is probably one of the ones I see the most here uh, in the area, and th this is deceiving because these bugs are very small. The adult um, in the, the largest version here is, is only about a quarter inch uh, from uh, antenna to end. So it's very small. The damage is what you're going to see. It makes, uh, because they're not feeding in any a given pattern, it, it makes very uh, odd and, and just random patterns in the grass. A lot of times it's associated, it begins where it's next to sidewalks or something like that where the grass is warmer. But if you dig around in the soil, uh, if you dig around in the grass, Right here in the zones between the good grass and the dead grass, you might be able to find some. I like to kind of pull out chunks and, and throw it on the sidewalk and spread it out and, and look for the little crawling insects uh, that way. And then sod webworms is another one that we had a lot of problem with. It, it, um, 
frequently will see the moss. It's, it's actually the, uh, the damaging portion is, is the worm, but we see the moths as we walk out on the lawn. They'll fly up in clouds. They're kind of white, gray looking when they fly. But they'll, they'll fly up and then they'll settle down again. And if they're mating, a couple weeks later, we might start seeing damage in the grass because what they've done is laid eggs in the grass and then these, uh, these guys hatch. That's, that's actually my finger. Uh, I got this, uh, found this in a lawn in Ormond. So uh, you can look for, it, the damage is similar to the, 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 <clears throat> the webworm, I mean, the, the, the damage similar, is similar. The damage is similar to chinch bugs, but when you look down in there, you might see the webbing and things like that, they would give it away. So uh, that would, and you can find this, uh, and you, if you find the worm, of course, but also look for damage, like chewing on the blades of grass. You might, that might be an indication. I didn't cover the other insects because I really haven't seen as much of them. And quite frankly, you see grubs all the time, but I haven't seen anybody lose their lawn to it. So I'm just going to move on to disease control. And this large patch disease is probably the primary thing that we have. Um, everybody sees the large circles. What's happening is the, the disease starts off in, in one spot and it spreads out evenly from there. And actually sometimes it doesn't, doesn't really kill the grass. So you'll see sometimes the grass coming back in the middle, but then um, different circles will grow into each other, so you start getting these uh, strange appearances. But this is a fungal disease, and you can take care of this with, uh, with fungicides, but again, this is all connected. So pest control, disease control, and weed control are all affected by how well the lawn is uh, otherwise, how good the soil is, and things like that. So if you don't get those things taken care of, and if you have thatch and poor drainage, you're more likely to have disease. OK, this is a pretty long, wordy paragraph here, but I thought it was important. When it comes to weed control options, it's, there's a lot of weeds out there. But it's important to know that the best weed control option is a well-managed turf. Dense, healthy lawns are less susceptible to infestations because they're able to outcompete most weeds for space. However, weak lawns with bare spots, thinned by disease, insects, and improper cultural practices are prone to weed invasion. Cultural practices such as timely fertilization, mowing at the correct height and frequency, and integrated pest management programs promote healthy lawns and significantly reduce the potential for weed establishment. Relatively few weeds can compete with the properly managed lawns. Chronic weed problems in lawns may indicate unfavorable soil conditions. Procedures that correct soil problems can reduce weed infestations by making growing conditions more favorable for the turf grass. So this is, this is what I'm talking about. Everything's linked together. If you don't get the soil right from the very beginning when you're establishing the lawn, it might be why you're having weeds and so many problems now. Um, and so on. So let's talk about weed control. So there are hundreds of weeds, but luckily there are only three categories. There's broadleafs, grasses, and sages. Now fortunately, we have categories of herbicides that are selective herbicides that can kill broadleaf plants only. We can have in herbicides that kill grasses only, and we have herbicides that kill sedges only. So if we have a broadleaf, like a clover growing in the grass, we can put on a selective herbicide that will leave the grass alone, but kill those clover, right? Now, if we have a weed grass growing in our grass, well, we can't use a selective herbicide for that because the same selective herbicide that will kill the weed grass will kill our good grass, right? Um, and then there's sedges, which is a totally different category. And again, they have their own category of product. And then finally, the weeds are also subdivided into if they grow in the warm season or if they are cool season plants. A lot of times, if we just ignore a weed, it will go away on its own just as the weather changes. But <laughs> that is a different story. Now, in the Louisiana Lawn's Best Management Practices Guide, in the back, there is this, this weed control chart. And it starts off with the winter weed management. 
So these are going to be the weeds that like to grow in the cool season. And if it's a grass, you can use a pre-emergent herbicide that will prevent those grass seeds from germinating. Because most weeds that we deal with are actually annuals, so they grow in one season, produce seeds, and then die. And it's those seeds that they produce that we deal with next year. So if, you can uh, if we can prevent those seeds from germinating, we can prevent them from growing. And then so on, it goes down the list of different products to use and when to use them. And then you get into the summer weed management. So the summer weeds are the ones that are starting to grow now. Here in March, all of these summer weeds are, are sprouting up everywhere. So you can take these various measures. You'd like to see what you have and try to match it with the herbicide here. We have lots of resources, I'm going to talk about that in a second, to try to figure out what weeds you have and things like that. But I just don't have time to cover every single weed in this one, uh, uh, in this one presentation. Now hand pulling, all herbicides aside, hand pulling is a really good way to get rid of some of these weeds, especially since a lot of these weed problems start off very small. They start off with one or two plants, but they produce a lot of seeds. So if you let one of these plants go to full term, uh, next year, instead of having one or two, you're going to have 50. And guess what? The year after that, you're going to have 5,000, something like that. So anytime that you get the, the jump on these weeds, you're doing better off. So hand pulling is a really good way to get a lot of these weeds out of your yard. Now, when I was talking about all the resources, you know, one of my major main jobs is not necessarily to go out and do all of these things. I'm not here to go out and treat anyone's uh, mole crickets or anything like that. What I am supposed to do is disseminate information, and our experts have done a really good job of organizing and making all these publications for us. Just about any problem that we have in our lawn, there's a separate publication that has been updated recently with instruction, with information on exactly what it is, how to control it with cultural practices, how to control it with chem uh, chemical options if necessary, but you can just type in your search engine, like uh, sod webworms, LSU, and you're going to find this publication. It's going to tell you what they are, when they are, and how to take care of them. And that includes thatch, that includes fertilization, and so on and so on. It's really a great source. So this is a good source of information. Also, every month we have the GNO Gardening Magazine that we come out. And on the last page, I do the um, do's and don'ts. Uh, I, know, I looked it up, and you, don'ts is, is, is a word. So, um, of lawn control. Do's and don'ts is of lawn control. If you're not getting the GNO Gardening magazine, go ahead and write to gnogardening at agcenter.lsu.edu, and we will send you a copy. And also, don't forget to follow us on our Facebook page at GNO Gardening.